The Aussie Res is a two metre rudder elevator speed brake electric glider built from a laser cut kit. The Southern Soaring League in South Australia selected it to replace the Radian in their Fun Fly One Design competition when that venerable three channel foamy went out of production. So how does it compare to the Radian and is it a replacement for it in that One Design competition? Here's some first impressions after building one and flying it for a few hours to get used to the controls. The Aussie Res is a two metre electric glider designed by Alan Mayhew and Marcus Stent, both very experienced flyers. It's a laser cut kit with all the parts, plans and some jigs included. It's manufactured in Australia by Performance Models and it retails for about 295 Australian dollars. You supply the powertrain, receiver and servos. If you plan to fly competition, you'll also need an altitude limiter. I'm using an Altus Micro from Aerobtech. It can limit altitude and motor run time, and it also records a good array of flight data. Our model was a collaborative effort. I purchased the kit and sourced the components, but I'm short of time and building space, so my friend Wim did the construction. He has a little more time, and he's a much better builder than me. There was considerable discussion at the club about how powertrain options should be limited. In the end, we decided on a maximum climb rate of five meters per second, a maximum altitude of 150 meters, and a maximum motor run of 30 seconds. With those limits in mind, we selected a Turnergy SK3 2830 millimeter 1020 kV motor with a Turnergy AE 25 amp speed controller and a Turnergy 800 milliamp hour 2S 40 to 50C LiPo battery. That motor and ESC were spares that I had on hand from some foam combat planes that I used to fly. They'd proven very durable even under combat conditions with 3S batteries. With a 2S battery, we calculated we were unlikely to exceed a 25 amp draw through the ESC. The motor fitted into the standard cockpit space, but we decided to go with the rear mounting system to simplify prop changes and cable routing. That involved moving the firewall back into the cockpit and adding some extra ventilation to allow airflow over the motor. The hole in the spacer at the back of the cockpit was enlarged slightly so we could mount the battery under the wing for reasons which will become obvious shortly. Ultimately, we selected 11 by six carbon fiber blades on a 38 millimeter aluminium spinner and a yoke from Hobby King out of Hong Kong. Delivery took several months due to COVID restrictions on air freight. And for a while there, it went completely AWOL. When it finally arrived, it was a very neat fit, but seemed a little heavy. We really went over the top with servos. Any cheap nine gram servo would probably do the job. And in fact, I had a pile of HXT 900s on hand that had proven bulletproof in combat models, but they seemed like a cheap option having used top quality gear elsewhere in the model. We settled on Dual Sky DS169 servos. At just nine grams and eight and a half millimeters thick, they pack an amazing punch with metal gears and 2.3 kilogram centimeter torque. Probably a little overkill at $43 each, but heck, you only need three. The 2S batteries also turned into a bit of a saga. I bought two 800 milliamp hour batteries since rough calculations suggested we'd get five or six launches out of each one of those. Unfortunately, one of them died very prematurely while we were setting the servo throws. I was reluctant to order more out of Hong Kong due to the long delivery times and an equivalent one wasn't available in Australia. Plus, by then we also knew that we had a weight problem up front. So I found a 550 milliamp hour battery rated at 65C that was a little lighter and in the Australian Hobby King warehouse. Unfortunately, that battery came with a proprietary plug that didn't fit any of my charging gear. After partially disassembling the battery and scavenging the balance lead from a dead battery, I was good to go, but only four grams lighter. Wim did an amazing job on the build. He started with a handicap since the kit was short a few carbon parts due to the large batch ordered by the club. 
all of the parts eventually arrived and the quality of the laser cutting makes for a very accurate build if you're careful. But there are a few traps for inexperienced builders. I know some people have tried to build this on a flat surface, but you can't, you have to build this half and then that half because it's got some dihedral. The mid and outer panels are built completely separately and then all segments are carefully joined with carbon tubes. The leading edge carbon spar is a very small diameter to form the sleek airfoil, but it leaves very little contact area for the covering film. You have to cover the entire wing, the cord in one go, so from the trailing edge all the way round back to the trailing edge. There are 11 separate items that had to be covered. I did it in instalments. I knew that if I left it all till the end, I would have an absolute gutful. <laughs> we used ultra coat light film on all of the built up parts, white for the center sections and red on all the tips to try and help with orientation when the model's a long way out. For the finish on the fuselage, we went with a simple white paint job and no filler since we were more interested in keeping the weight down than a glass smooth finish. The tail fins in two pieces, one above and one below the carbon boom. Getting them precisely aligned is not so easy, but it's absolutely critical to fly straight and true. Another improvement would be to make the fin one piece. In the end, I, I got there, but the inexperienced builder will struggle to get that right. The tail planes fitted to the boom with two self-tapping screws that are really too big for the job and likely to split the mounting post. So Wim went with a couple of smaller ones. The push rods are carbon fibre with simple 90 degree bent piano wire ends fitted with heat shrink tube. Getting the length exactly right is critical since the splines on a small servo drive shaft make for pretty coarse adjustment. While the servos are superb quality and have four mounting holes, they come with two microscopic mounting screws. So we thieved a couple of larger ones from another servo to keep them where they belong. Ready to fly weight for our glider was 587 grams. That gives it a pretty light wing loading for a two meter electric glider and that's reflected in its performance, particularly in light air. When all was said and done, it's a beautiful model. And the first glide test was a testament to Wim's fastidious construction. It didn't need a single click of trim on that first glide. I use an old Futaba T6EX 2.4 gigahertz transmitter for this model. It's a pretty simple radio, but it's plenty for a four channel RES ship. The FASST signal link has proven rock solid in numerous models and all kinds of flying situations. There are also a number of different receivers out there, including some really small and light ones that are good for high performance gliders. As the glide test approached, we knew we still had to contend with a CG that was 15 millimeters forward of the recommended position, which curiously is well behind the main spar. We even made an aluminium nut to replace the stainless steel one on the collet that holds the prop and save 12 grams there. But we were still forward of the recommended CG range. So we added a small strip of lead to the tail to get it to the front of the recommended range. We figured that's a safe starting point for our maiden flight. The glide test went very well. After a little porpoising due to me getting used to the very effective elevator, each glide got a little longer as I got used to letting the glider do its thing and after a few runs it flew right across the oval without hardly touching the controls. After a 30 second test motor run, nothing got hot and it passed the smell test. I noticed the motor slowing down a little at the end of the run suggesting that the battery voltage was dropping but it wasn't significant. The maiden powered flight was nearly scuttled when we found that the captive nut on the front wing mounting bolt had gone missing. We've lost the captive nut. Uh. But we found it stuck to the magnets beneath one of the servos. Conditions were nearly ideal with almost no wind and scattered low cumulus cloud indicating some thermal activity. For the maiden flight, Wim did the launch and I was on the controls. I'm good. Everything went according to plan with a short motor run and return circuit to land. Emboldened by success, we did a full 30 second motor run and got to about 80 metres. 
I got into some gentle lift at the top of the climb and the model showed it well and settled into some good thermal turns. On the approach to land, I tried out the speed brake and was reminded that you should always test new things at least three mistakes high. The speed brake is big and brutally effective. It pitched down hard and I really had to haul on the elevator to avoid spearing in. I've now added some elevator compensation to the speed brake, but you still need to use it gently. If you hit the brakes hard, you'll come down in a hurry. We gave it three more motor runs on the 550 milliamp hour battery. On the best run, it climbed at about 3.8 metres a second and got to about 120 metres, both of which are well inside the limits for the new competition. I found a small thermal on the last run and it climbed at about one metre per second in the lift. I've been getting about five full motor runs out of that 550 milliamp hour battery. And when I recharge it, it suggests I've still got one or two in reserve. That fifth flight is usually pretty sluggish, so you get plenty of warning when the battery's running low. We swapped to the 800 milliamp hour battery and Wim was on the sticks. Wim flies RES models with rudder on the right stick. So we had that mixed 100% into the rudder so that either stick will do the job. The flight went very well, but a nasty wind shear just before landing put the nose in rather firmly. All of the joints held together, but the thin ply around the cockpit partially delaminated, so flying was over for the day. Since then, I've flown it a few times in various conditions, and my overall experience is that it has plenty of rudder and elevator authority, it turns well, but it doesn't like jibing downwind, so you really need to plan those turns well ahead. It's sensitive in the air, even with the CG well forward of the recommended position. So it's easy to see when you're in lift and respond to make use of it. Penetration rate is not great, despite the sleek airfoil. You could add ballast, but that would defeat the philosophy of our light build. Our overall impression is that it's a well-designed model that flies well in light air. I like the design a lot. It's a delicate design that doesn't tolerate hard landings. You need to fly over a really soft surface and take extra care getting the approaches right. The kit could be improved with a few refinements to ease the build, particularly for less experienced modelers. It was tricky to build, definitely not for the inexperienced. So is it a replacement for the Radian? Well, it's a rudder elevator only model, so the flight control system is basically the same, but Beyond that, it's in another league entirely. It's a high performance model if you already have plenty of experience building and flying RES models, but it's definitely not PNP and probably not a beginner's model. It's also substantially more delicate than the Radian, so damage is more likely and more difficult to repair. The wide array of powertrain options also strays from the one design that characterized the Radian competition. The addition of a speed brake gives you the option to go into RES competition, but that'd be another step up for beginners as well. At 295 Australian dollars, it's about the same as a Radian out of the box, but you have to supply the powertrain and the servos, so the all up cost is probably another hundred dollars. Then of course, there's the extra time for the build, which will prove daunting for some, but for others, it will add to the satisfaction of owning a cutting edge model.